Um, hello, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome to, to all of you. And, and thank you for joining us for the third session of Inter Archives Conversations. I hope that you all are keeping well and taking good care of yourselves. I'm Sneha Raghavan. I'm Senior Researcher and Projects Lead at Asia Archive in India, and I'm based in New Delhi. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with our work, Asia Art Archive is an independent nonprofit organization that was set up in the year 2000 in response to the urgent need to document and make accessible recent histories of art in the region. Um, AA's main office is in Hong Kong, where we have a reference library with a growing collection of books, catalogs, periodicals, and zines from across Asia. Our archival materials are digitized and made accessible online through our website. And we also organize programs, exhibitions, and publications. Um, Asia, Art Archives, uh, Asia Art Archive in India's office is based in New Delhi, where we also have a small reference library and provide access to our on-site digital collections. Um, it is open to visitors by appointment, so if you do find yourself in Delhi next time, do write to us and, and drop by. Um, now, one of the projects that we've been working on over the last nearly two years across Delhi, Hong Kong, and Kathmandu is Mobile Library Nepal. Um, this is a collaboration between Asia Art Archive and the Siddhartha Arts Foundation. Um, and it is a traveling library which circulates books on recent art from Asia within Nepal. Um, it was officially launched in February this year with the generous support of the Foundation for Arts Initiatives. And um, through a series of on-site and online programs with educators, artists, universities, and independent arts organizations, the site of the library is being activated since its launch, and it is currently situated at Kalo 101 in Patan in Nepal. Um, now, before we move into the specifics of today's program, I'd first like to invite Asia Archive's new executive director, Christopher K. Ho, to say a few words. Chris. Thank you so much, Sneha, uh, for that uh, introduction to Asia Art Archive and, and me, and thank you to the listeners who are joining us today or tonight from Nepal, India, Pakistan, other parts of South Asia, Hong Kong, and elsewhere. So my name is Christopher Ho, and I am the new executive director of Asia Art Archive. And I am particularly pleased to have the opportunity to welcome you this evening as the community building that underpins the Inter-Archives conversation series is essential to Asia Art Archive in India, in Hong Kong, and in America. As the name Asia Art Archive implies, our mission, as Neha briefed you, since our founding over 20 years ago, is to identify, digitize, and make publicly accessible materials from and around recent art in Asia. It is also to question, in collaboration, and in dialogue with peers, like the ones you'll hear from tonight, the possibilities for persuasions and power of archives. How do archives guide the stories we tell each other and to ourselves? How, how might these stories recursively fold back and inform the structure and content of past and future archives? Can storytelling itself be a form of active archiving? Which stories are obscured and which resound? Tonight, as we listen to various responses to these and many other questions, you will hear the distinct grain of our distinguished panelists' voices. Diwas Raja KC, Sophia Balagamwala, and ASM Rizar Rahman hail from diverse and different initiatives. Co-organizer of this panel, Nepal Picture Library, Citizens Archive of Pakistan, and Drick Picture Library. They bear witness to the complexity of and contradictions in each archive and collectively to the vast potentials of archiving. So a very warm welcome to our speakers and to you, our listeners, for joining. I will now pass the floor back to Sneha. Thank you, Chris. Um, on to our session now. And, and please bear with me for the longish introduction. Um, now, one of the crucial areas that the programs at Mobile Library Nepal have been reflecting on is archiving. Um, the growing interest in the practice of archiving as well as archival initiatives that have emerged in recent times in the region. 
So with inter-archives conversations, the idea is to have a platform for institutions and individuals working with archives in the region to come together and share about the forms and infrastructures of their archives, how they think about their work, and situate the materials in context of the urgencies of the present. So for us, Nepal becomes a point of departure and South Asia a context to hold these conversations, not in the strictest sense of, ge of a geopolitical region, but rather as a way to think about certain shared affinities and histories to ground our concerns. So how can we share our materials and our processes with each other? How can we learn from each other? Uh, and also perhaps ask each other some critical questions. Now, inter-archives conversations are conceived as a series of four conversations spread over a year in conjunction with Mobile Library Nepal. And each conversation is conceptualized in collaboration with an archive in Nepal based on the key concerns and interests of the archive in question. Now, as we know, an archive, any archive, is hardly ever able to present itself to us in its entirety in one glimpse, as it were. There are always infrastructures, perhaps lines of inquiry, or narratives through which we encounter the archive. And without these, the archive would come across as a seemingly abstract, perhaps even a unidimensional and a homogenous entity. So it is really through these narratives of and from the archive that the documents and the stories emerging from them, the people working at the back end of the archive, or even the urgencies that led to the collection of such materials, come alive. So these narratives are presented to us in many ways. They take the form of writing, of exhibitions, publications, artistic interventions, collaborations, citations, and much more. And with digital tools and media, this is taken to another level as it is. And so today's conversation, which we have organized in collaboration with Nepal Picture Library, focuses on the act of creating narratives of and from archives with a specific focus on the urgencies of citizens' archives. And given that, you know, the, the question of who gets to be identified as a citizen and who doesn't continues to be a burning sort of political issue in South Asia and, and globally, really, how does this get articulated via the archive is also something maybe we're hoping to, to explore. Now, I want to read here a line from Nepal Picture Library, who are our you know, co-organizers for today's session, and, and their description of their work. They say, and I quote, the archive serves as a safe and open repository for materials that can secure a multicultural and pluralist representation of Nepali history. The archive functions as a medium for active public engagement through which Nepali people can deepen meaningful connections with the past, close quotes. And so archives do at least two things. One, they perform a representative function. You know, a citizen's archive, for instance, may represent a nation's history perhaps, but what kind of history is that? For whom is it? Where is it coming from, right? Um, and, and second, um, archives perform a mediating function. They narrativize, they activate, they seek engagement for all the documents and all the presences that are there within the archive. So with this, I, I welcome our, our speakers for today. We have Divas Raja Kesi, who is Head of Research and Archives at Nepal Picture Library in Kathmandu. We have Sophia Balagamwala, who is an artist curator and at present the advisor to the Citizens Archive of Pakistan. And we have ASM Rezao Rehman, who is the curator and general manager of BRIC Bangladesh, as well as executive director of Chobi Mela. Now, more detailed biographies of our speakers can be found on the programs page on our, on our website. Um, and I want to thank all of them for, for accepting our, our invitation to speak today. Now, before I invite Divas to, to make his presentation, some quick housekeeping. Um, this session will be for one and a half hours. The speakers will be presenting their work in the first 45 minutes, and then we will have a conversation and open it up you know, to questions from audiences. Now, if you have questions, please type them in Zoom's Q&A feature, and you can do this at any point of time during the talk or after, and we will do our best to take them up in the discussion. Um, so without further ado, I, I now hand it over to Divas. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Neha, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and uh, I've also realized that, you know, since the conversation we had, I've taken a slightly different tack with, our, with, with my presentation today. Um, I guess I'm occupied with some other concerns um, 
and that will sort of reveal themselves through the presentation. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I want to open by thanking um, the Asia Art Archive team, um, as well as the Mobile uh, Library Nepal for organizing this special event. Um, and on behalf of uh, Nepal Picture Library, uh, I'm delighted to be participating in the dialogue today. Um, in my view, um, I should share my screen first, in my view. <laughs> Oopsie, um, I might need help now. It's not, um, my, my uh, slideshow, the screen's not coming up. Yeah, thank you so much, Sonia. Uh, yeah, in my view, uh, this whole series of inter-archives conversations is a vital endeavor. Um, it's providing a ground where both the archive as a professional practice with a special set of questions and dilemmas, uh, as well as the archive as um, a, as a concept, or let's say a loose uh, metaphor, um, that both can be held together. The archive, of course, uh, no longer refers to a stable storage of information bearing materials, uh, but has itself become the world, um, has itself become a sort of like a word to denote certain anxieties about living in this very hypermediated societies uh, that's based on information overflow. Uh, next slide, uh, Samira. I hope my own talk today would be received in the spirit captured in the series title Interarchives that perhaps pressures us to recognize that if archives are to preserve their role in today's information landscape, uh, it is imperative that archives take seriously the conditions of collaboration, uh, participation, and uh, proliferation. I wanted to specifically thank uh, Sneha and Samira uh, for not only being an ideal, in, uh, for uh, not only being ideal interlocutors during the planning for today's talk, but also because the questions that uh, Samira sent out uh, about the relation between the archive and the narrative form, uh, about the not at all straightforward connection between archives and publics, uh, will be the spur for my reflections today. Uh, next slide. Since I have been since I have been given the prerogative to use my slot to make uh, propositions uh, in lieu um, of a presentation on Nepal Picture Library, I'm going to take it up um, um, in order to hopefully open up the conversation further. And I will be speaking in a somewhat uh, speculative vein uh, through a series of semi-formed uh, thoughts. And this will reflect both where my headspace has been through this very confusing year, and also hopefully um, inklings about uh, which directions I think conversations about archives uh, and media practices need to go. Samira asked about the forms in which the archives exist as well as circulate, uh, forms that range for Nepal Picture Library from um, publications, exhibitions to digital da databases. While ordinarily I might have answered Samira's questions about the narrative outputs of archives in the affirmative, um, much of which much of which Sneha covered in the introduction as well. That is, uh, yes, narrative is key to how we seek to challenge dominant histories. Um, today, I think I want to say that this relation between archives and narrations is no longer straightforward. It is, it is fair to assume, of course, that citizen-based archives have a close relation to counter-narrative strategies. Next slide, Samira. We, ju we justify our very existence as an archive on the recognition of gaps in our national, archi national narratives that silences, and in, um, that silences are inherent in the writing of history as well as the creation of archives. We exist because we believe that the problem of archival silence isn't simply a matter of evidence gathering. Instead, we underscore that uh, records have other contextualities that can be revealed only through new archival methods. And, and photographs are a very good example of this. Um, our our uh, counter-narrative strategies are also registered in two, in two primary ways in which we present our archives, which uh, we claim will either fill in the gaps or disrupt the foundational narrative that nation states um, need to justify their own ex ex existence. And I'm hoping uh, Sophia and Reza will speak more on this aspect. Uh, for my part, I wanted to take the question of narrativity 
uh, slightly elsewhere. So when we talk about the archive, uh, we generally understand it to mean the content of the archive. That is uh, different types of records and collections. Like um, it would mean for us who is in the photograph, what is happening in the photograph um, and so on. But implicit in uh, Samira's question is also the issue of form. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Samira? For reasons uh, perhaps obvious, the form I think that needs our attention is the digital platform. Perhaps it's the intensified digitization of our lives of, that has happened over the last two years, or perhaps it's because um, at Nepal Picture Library, we are currently working hard to move uh, all our collections to an online database. But the question of how the digital media is reconfiguring the very processes of remembering and forgetting has been kind of occupying me. Of course, Nepal Picture Library owes its very existent, existence to digitality. How could we exist if uh, digital technology had not freed the parameters for, for, parameters for archival storage through upload and download functions, uh, assisted by what we unironically call the computer's uh, random access memory? Um, the fact that we have designated ourselves archivists without any training in information or library sciences has a lot to do with how digital technology has loosened the hold um, sovereign powers and states um, have over the way um, societies organize collective memory today. Um, so NPL's, NPL's primary work, uh, next slide, is uh, digitization, that is remediating analog uh, photographs as digital photographs. The theoretical foundation for digitization is the radical democratization of memory. The principle of uh, digitization drives nearly all archives today because it promises to solve the problem of space and uh, site specificity um, as pressures from outside, not least the various redresses for uh, archival, ar archival silences that uh, we've been talking about, of which all citizen archives are uh, essential efforts, um, exhort ever more materials of every type and format to be preserved as valuable to public life and collective memory. Uh, that, is, that is a capacity impossible without digital technology. Digitization assists quick uh, search and instant availability of memory objects to anyone from anywhere in the world. So compression, Resolution, software upgrade, synchronization, compatibility, flow, transfer. These are the concepts with which uh, digital societies seek their mem memorization and self-image. Uh, with ever intensifying pressure for archives to function within the stream of uh, constant communication and connectivity. Save everything. Um, that is the new archival imperative. Uh, next slide. Um, the important thing about uh, a digital archive is its mathematical algorithmic structure, which is to say, even as we turn to the digital to enable our counter narrative strategies, the digital form itself is radically divorced from narrativity. Uh, and uh, um, Wolfgang, Wolfgang Ernst would be very in instructive here, uh, who says, uh, whereas the 19th and 20th century archives were dependent on the meaning and narrative coherence of textual print media, uh, and the profession of history likewise relied on close reading and textual interpretation, these literary and narrative tools do not have um, an essential link to the computer processes behind digital archives, uh, for which the only thing that matters is that an object can be turned into information as transmittable bytes of data. The data structure of uh, digital archives uh, favor navigation of vast droves of materials that can be connected through information nodes uh, you can input, rather than narrative building from careful reading of limited records. And their algorithmic power facilitates free associative and uh, discontinuous search and retrieval rather than semantic uh, research. Um, when you think about it, actually, much of the counter narrative projects uh, we have done at Nepal Picture Library, from uh, Dalit A Quest for Dignity uh, to the Feminist Memory Project, have heavily relied on um, this associative and similarity based retrieval 
uh, keyword searches and other mathematical capacities of the computer uh, to read the archives in ways that can challenge uh, specific silences of the archives. Uh, next slide. The relation between archive memory and uh, narrative, um, uh, which, I'm, which is what I'm trying to say, cannot be taken for granted in the digital platform. And this has huge consequences for, the, for how digital archives conceive themselves and what kind of uses these archives uh, prepare themselves for. Um, I think it is important to point out uh, the strong correlation and overlap between the imperative of hyperconnected digital media and the ostensible objectives of citizen archives like ours. Um, next slide. Um, there's a Canadian archivist called Terry Cook um, who has this uh, wonderful uh, essay titled, We Are What We Keep, We Keep What We Are, uh, where he lays out the history of archival thinking as four evolutionary st stages of archival policy. In the final and current phase of the archive, he says, the, archive, the archives seek to engage citizens directly. Citizens broadly defined uh, become not only participants, but also the keepers of the archives. And archivists relate to citizens through a blend of coaching, um, partnership, and collaborating. These archives, based on broad participation of citizens, are made technologi technologically possible by digital media. Various communities today um, initiate their own community archives, seeking to gain control over their own narratives and representation. Uh, and even for those who aren't doing so, the quest for archival dignity um, has exploded. Um, and this can be witnessed in the multifarious ways um, and unexpected places where the concept of the archive is mobilized today. Uh, and much of, this, uh, much of these civic processes of developing archival consciousness uh, and broadening archival heritage uh, flourish in the internet and social networking. The, the growth of um, citizen archives, oral history projects, community archives, uh, visual repositories, constitute a new ecology of uh, memory of which you know, we see ourselves a part of. Um, uh, so this uh, memory has uh, broken free, uh, so to speak, from the institutional and classificatory regimes that organize the nation's memory or collective memory. It is, so it is increasingly um, impractical to persist with the concept of the archive as a stewardship over specific um, repositories and, and collections. Um, as Terry Cook suggests in the quote, uh, quote displayed, both because the communities of memory uh, are constituting themselves in radically new ways, and because the very material context of the digital milieu uh, has changed what memory is and what uh, memory does, um, archives desperately need uh, new theories and approaches. So my own pr preoccupation uh, with the digital as I, ha I have been displaying, um, probably has to do with the fact that Nepal Picture Library has um, been working on our um, ambitious new website uh, to house all our collections. And uh, next slide, Samira. And designing the new interface, um, it, dawns on, um, it dawns on you where one's archival identity um, colludes or collides with the dig digital interface culture. Um, interface, of course, is where the machinic um, non-human computational operations interact with the visual, oral, and the tactile dimensions of um, human sense perception. Um, so on our uh, digital interface, we are constantly trying to create descriptions for semantic narrative meaning making um, of our records, uh, but also at the same time, we have to create connective nodes, uh, links, and pathways that, that encourage uh, bypassing descriptions altogether. Um, and so it appears to us as a kind of a contradiction, uh, you know, when we move to the digital platform. Um, um, Dibas, and, uh, sorry yeah. to interrupt, you have about two minutes. Two, two minutes. minutes, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So digitally fost uh, dig digitality fosters new uh, values, availability, uh, accessibility, unchecked commentary, open access, right to know, instantaneous search, immediate retrieval, user friendliness, and easy help functions. Uh, flexibility for mobile device users. Uh, so these aesthetic and functional pulls of data mining, 
commercial search engines like Google, or for us, the stock archive uh, of Getty images loom heavily over our own sort of expectations of how our archive would be used. Uh, on the digital interface, archives have to be recalibrated uh, to these new culture and uh, cultural and political values fostered by the digital condition. Uh, so it's no longer it's no longer discovery through archival perusal, but rather instant retrieval of items from vast databases that uh, archives have to prepare for. So, so looking beyond um, our own um, specific initiatives, we find that we are doing our work at a critical juncture in media history uh, that affects the very ontology of archives um, and the parameters of, parameters of memory. So there is first um, the, the democratization of archives uh, is what, what we've been sort of discussing. Uh, and the various endeavors of uh, citizen archive projects reflected in today's uh, panel uh, are good examples of this. Uh, Nepal Picture Library, for example, for a number of years now, we've, uh, we have seen ourselves as an archive whose appraisal about uh, valuable documents include, first, the belief that archives should reflect a broad human experience and social life. Second, attention to social movements because they provide distinct uh, pers perspectives of the public's relation with, with the state. Uh, third, the recognition that memory keeping requires broad participation and involvement of publics. And fourth, the realization that uh, digital tools need to be harnessed to tackle the changing infrastructures of memory. We have noted that uh, the ability of citizen archives like ours to exp expand the con content and form of the archive is profoundly um, linked to specific affordances of digital technology, as well as to the cultural logic that makes digital the dominant media and metaphor, metaphor in, the, uh, in, in the first place. Uh, the myths about uh, digital media democratization are, are of course true to a great, great extent. Uh, we know how much the digital platform depends on our participation and creation of personal traits uh, through clicking, swiping, commenting, emoting, liking, tagging, sharing, trolling, so on. But we also know that the hyper-connectivity in which we are, we and our archive participates cannot be apprehended through old shibboleths of democracy, public sphere, and authoritarianism. Um, I may, have, I may appear to have veered from um, quite far from the question of narrativity that uh, Samira set, up, set us off on. Um, the reason I have been foregrounding the digital uh, in our work is because the task of breaking archival silences today uh, may involve both a narrative building strategy uh, and an anti-narrative strategy, both of which correspond to the challenges archives are facing in the uh, new ecolo ecology of information. Um, I think I'll, I'm going to stop there because <laughs> it's going to go on for a few more minutes if I continue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much, um, Divas, for, for this. I think um, there's been such an amazing range of, of provocations there. And I, I hope that we are able to sort of bring them up in, in the discussion also with the other um, speakers as well. Um, our next speaker is um, Sophia Balagamwala. Um, welcome, Sophia. And, and I invite you to make your presentation. Hello, Sneha. Um, can you see my um, screen? Yes. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me, Sneha. I'm so honored to be part of um, a panel with practitioners whose projects are and efforts I deeply admire. And thank you so much, Samira, for your guidance. Um, I'll begin with uh, some information about the Citizens Archive, or uh, CAP, as we refer to it and um, my place and work with GAP. So um, the Citizens Archive is a nonprofit I've worked with for over the past 10 years. It was founded in 2007 by a group of individuals across different disciplines with the initial aim to collect stories of the partition generation before they were lost forever. So the first stories being collected are those of the partition generation who migrates from India to Pakistan in and around 1947. 
um, their journeys, the things that they left behind, the early days of Pakistan, the first refugee camp set up, the first government offices, and um, how they started these new lives in this new country. And then later on, um, we expand to collecting many other stories, many other narratives, and I'll probably come back to these um, a little later, what kinds of stories are collected, why and how. Um, so what does CAP do? It collects um, oral histories. It, um, this is our founders over here. Um, so we collect oral histories, we um, digitize images, uh, memorabilia, photographs, uh, even publications. And, um, and then what we do is uh, curation, which refers to the archival process, but then also the research design and design of programming of uh, permanent and temporary exhibitions. And then where I come in is uh, dissemination. So I've worked with CAP since 2011 in the capacity of research, curation, and educational programming. And um, initially we have um, done a series of kiosks, tiny pop-up museums um, in different places. Um, these are a few of them. Um, this is a later project actually that is quite amazing that I'm not a part of, but I'm excited to share. And, um, and then our sort of uh, largest project has been uh, our first permanent museum project. And uh, this is something we started working on in 2016. Um, so it's called the National History Museum, and uh, this is a project between CAP, a nonprofit, and uh, the government of Punjab. So it's a nonprofit and uh, stake uh, and state relationship. So you can understand the kinds of uh, stakeholders that are involved. Um, so the the museum is part is in the Great Iqbal Park in Lahore, and it is steps away from the Minare Pakistan, which is a monument of huge historical uh, significance and the site where the um, Pakistan resolution was passed. Um, and um, I should have made you do this. Okay, but we're fine. We'll come back here. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop here. So uh, the artist Fred Wilson and Samira, I've also kind of taken your questions and gone off somewhere. So hopefully you can bring me back in the Q&A. Um, the artist Fred Wilson says, I'm interested in the museum because it's a place where no one expects to be misled. Whatever they give you, you believe. And um, I'm using this as sort of a starting thinking point uh, because for the most part, the public perception is that you go into museums expecting fact or expecting a truth. Uh, whereas the aims of museums, although some of them are noble and good. So for example, a lot of national museums aim to tell the history of a country, build community, be a space for visitors. Um, but it's important to be uh, very critical of these spaces, I think, even if we are working in them, I think we have to be very careful about um, what can happen and what is going on, because neither the archive nor the museum are neutral spaces. Uh, museums have never been egalitarian projects. Um, as a visitor, you're presented with certain values and certain knowledge in accordance with specific hierarchies and politics. And in fact, uh, museums have in the past in regimes been dangerous and misleading places filled with propaganda and have been used to reinforce agendas of nation building pro projects and very uh, problematic ideologies because stories can be exaggerated and stories can be excluded. And these are two things um, that uh, happen very much so in museum projects, but then also in um, in archives. Um, so my colleague Alia Tayyabi, who heads the oral history project at CAP, um, she puts this in, in a very poetic way that an archive can be a window into possible pasts, pasts being plural. And um, I, I was thinking about this in, in terms of being a very powerful provocation because I'm thinking about uh, the possible histories. So then I'm thinking about multiplicities, diversities, um, everything is um, sort of in the plural. And so I'm thinking of a plurality of things that can happen. Um, so I'm questioning if systems of collecting and narrative building and framing can create 
histories or can, can they mask histories or can they disrupt them? Um, and this is my question for both uh, the archive, but then also the museum, because a lot of our archive in this, in this work that I'm discussing exists within the museum context. Um, so the writer Amandeep Sandhu has said, uh, there is no such thing as nonfiction because nothing is objective. Reality is mediated through you as per your culture. And I think this is very important for practitioners and creators for us to acknowledge the power that we hold in these spaces and then the knowledge that we collect, but then also the knowledge that we select and the knowledge that we impart. Uh, what initially drew me to archives and specifically to oral histories, which is, and oral histories are, um, in case I haven't been clear enough, sort of at the heart of uh, GAPS project um, was the ability to rupture a single linear historical narrative. So in one way, multiple voices and oral histories have the power to disrupt this narrative. And so stories that don't make it to the dominant state approved, state issued textbooks narrative, um, they or those histories that have been reduced to say maybe a small paragraph. And this could be the histories of um, women in a freedom movement, or this could be something like um, um, the history of East Pakistan and Bangladesh in, in our larger Pakistani history. Um, these are certain histories that we, for instance, have um, taken on at GAP, amongst many more, but I'm just giving the example of these two. Um, and I'm sharing with you one attempt uh, and I say an attempt because I'm acknowledging that we have a lot of work to do and our work is not done and this is in process. So in 2011, um, 2011 marked the 40th anniversary of the 1971 war and the creation of Bangladesh. And CAP in conjunction with uh, the Basel Artists Collective created an exhibition that chronicled the period from the birth of Pakistan to the birth of Bangladesh with, um, uh, with an interactive timeline, including videos, photos, objects, oral histories, and archival material. Our archive was not enough to tell this story. And so we collaborated. And uh, this is where uh, collaboration comes in is so important um, that we had objects from Dhaka. We had um, a collaboration with the 1947 um, archive. Um, to get uh, oral histories uh, from the other side of the border. And apart from that, because our uh, collection of, of newspaper clippings was, was not enough because our press did not uh, publish everything, we shared um, press clippings from around the world at that time. Um, after that, we conducted our first oral history um, interview in Bangladesh in 2016, and currently we are uh, we are conducting a, a uh, interview project uh, via Zoom with expat members um, in Canada. And so, um, again, this is a part of our history that has been reduced to paragraphs, that has been glossed upon, that is uh, unclear in so many ways, but uh, through these efforts, we are trying to, um, to expand on it. And um, just, uh, okay, excuse me. All right, so we are trying our best to sort of keep this process going and not um, not neatly uh, close it off as chapter close, but, but to keep the conversation and the research and the collaborations going uh, to make this is history more uh, inclusive. And more than that, to educate, uh, again, those who come into a museum or those who interact with um, our dissemination um, to to also access this history, which is not available in the mainstream literature. Um, when I speak of framing, I speak of uh, a few different things. I speak of chronology, I speak of language, and I speak of design. So where we begin our story and how we construct a timeline within the museum context and within the archive itself, like where do you start? How do you start collecting stories and how do you share those stories? Um, this questions our relationship with our coloniality, our lack of acknowledgement of certain events, and um, if the music uh, museum once presented, in the words of art historian Kavita Singh, a complete and comprehensive archive of the empire, what kind of archive does this museum, does our museum, does our archive present now? Um, so this is an important question. Uh, another thing we think about a lot is design. And uh, because again, we are in the process of public festivals of school outreach tours of a museum, uh, we, uh, we are in the need to communicate and educate. 
and there and for uh, for information to be received in a certain way uh, it needs to be communicated in a way that is to put it very bluntly attractive and so what happens when you take content when you take thousands of stories and you try to make them into content you try to make them accessible and attractive um, you're essentially reducing it's inevitable that in some ways you reduce uh, people's stories, sometimes very painful memories and stories into uh, content. So how do you stop people from turning into content? Uh, we uh, have an amazing design team who also, uh, it, it's very easy to get distracted by all these things, but one of the things we all do, every part of the archive keeps doing, is going to oral history interviews and being part of that collection process so that you are not uh, dehumanizing the content and then you keep coming back to the fact that these are real individuals, these are their real stories. Um, so this is one of the ways we deal with that. Another thing that we deal with is that a lot of things are missing. So for example, there are missing pictures, there are missing objects. Uh, what do we do? How do we tell stories in that way? Um, within the museum and within exhibitions, we've used uh, virtual reality experiences. We've recreated stories with uh, collected objects and animations. And then again, I mean, I say something and then I talk about how dangerous it is, but there is a danger in this as well. When you go extremely hi-fi with all the special effects or when you, with which is possible with animation, things get very simplified and flattened out. The audio and, and, and again, the human voice is a very, is so powerful and moving. That is still there, but it is easy with design, with special effects, with these ways of creating narratives to simplify the narrative and to make the story something else, something lighter than it was, something uh, different than it was. So this is something also that is, um, that is a risk in this kind of narrative building within the museum. Um, Sophia, sorry to interrupt, you have about three minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, language, language is another big thing. Given our violent association of both the photograph and the caption with coloniality, how can we tell our story without falling into these formats? Is it even possible? Even if we start from the right, following the Urdu script as opposed to the left, even if we use a national language, we are still excluding many, many people. So how do you deal with the problem of language? Um, Sudha so Vrata Sengupta writes in his paper, The Notion Museum, museums change the stories that we tell about ourselves all the time. So how accessible and how exclusive are our captions and how easy it is to write or rewrite a history when given the power to create a caption. So then what is the possibility of the archive? How can the archive create these spaces for different histories and bodies of knowledge? Um, this is a portrait of Ustad Abdullah Khan. Uh, he is the last musician to play an instrument called the Shenai, an instrument that dates back to court culture in the style of renowned um, musician, the late Ustad Bismillah Khan. So the instrument popular in the courts pre-partition pre -part, pre because of the princely state now finds it difficult to be part of most orchestras, although it still is played at processions and weddings. But he, he is the last musician to play it in Pakistan. And so when, and because nobody wants to learn it, when he passes this, this knowledge, this practice, this, this sound is going to leave with him. Um, so in, in the tutelage of his practice through the sacred ustaj shagir relationship between teacher and pupil, a knowledge or a history is part da passed down. And um, the archive can preserve his story and it can save his voice, but it can't save his practice. And so with an example such as his, uh, perhaps the possibility is that we learn not just from his story, but from the way that knowledge is passed on, from the way things are remembered, taught and forgotten. So maybe we are learning not just how stories, uh, not just learning from the stories that we collect, but maybe we are also learning from the act of collection itself. And uh, maybe we are also learning from the archive how to listen. Um, my final note is uh, this. So uh, this is a personal experience. This is the museum um, site. It's drawn by an unknown laborer on site. It was drawn on a wall. And I did take a picture, but eventually it was also painted over. Um, and uh, we talk about memory and inclusion and erasure and oppression. But the thing is that even though we're in the business of saving memories and saving sites, um, 
and that sort of a thing, there can still be a kind of erasure that we ourselves are complicit in. And so I just keep this picture around to remind myself of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Sophia, for that wonderful presentation. Um, and, and hope to sort of discuss some of the, the, the points that you raised in, in the, in the Q&A. Um, our last uh, panelist for today is ASM Reza Rehman. Um, I welcome you, Reza, to the, to the panel and then over to you. Um, thank you, Sneha. Uh, thank you, Aisha Archive, for inviting me for uh, this talk. Um, I'm representing Dick Picture Library uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, I'm the curator and general manager here. Uh, just before we start uh, discussing on, on our archive, uh, I, I'd like to give a small um, background on, on the organization. Uh, Drake started uh, back in 1989 uh, with a specific mandate. Um, if, you, if you look at the time, uh, the representation of the country was uh, mostly were mostly made by uh, the Western eyes. So uh, some of the initiators, photographers um, thought that it should be changed. So Shahidul Alam, who is the founder of um, the picture library, um, he created this platform for photographers so that, so that they can um, tell their own stories. And uh, then the stories uh, the world is getting has, um, uh, has an authenticity. So the picture library was born with that mandate and of obviously the very first department of uh, the organization was an archive. Uh, an archive which started with uh, Dick's own photographers and but then later on it expanded. Uh, it created a platform for um, the veteran photographers, for the youth to come and, and join and so that you know they can um, uh, share their work, they can you know expand their network. So at some point, we actually understood that uh, just creating a platform for photographers is not enough. Uh, you have to uh, expand your horizon by educating your people, and you have to be um, so you have to be well equipped, you know, to not only to represent but also you know, to fight all the odds as a, as a media person. So um, back in '98, we decided to create a photography school. Um, uh, a school which provide education, uh, not only for, not only uh, the typical photography learning, but also um, uh, teaching um, uh, the word I was using, the representation, teaching how they will, you know, fight the odds and, and also is all the um, fighting the odds of the society. Uh, so, they can by the using the visual they can actually you know change or contribute to the change of the society so Parshala south asian media uh, academy institute uh, started with that and at some point um this school went quite well and then you know um, a lot of fine photographers were coming out of the school and at some point we uh, found that we at the same time uh, we were producing finest photographers but these finest photographers needed to be uh, showcased uh, and as you know that being in a uh, uh, in the majority world in, in 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 an asian country is very difficult to get um, to make your space um, in the global scenario because most of the global platform are hosted by the western world and they have their own eye so we decided rather taking them to the west we would uh, we wanted to bring the west to uh, our home and then of course you know cater uh, photographers in that platform so that's how the festival Chobi Mela um, started in 2000. So that's a nutshell of how um, um, culture, education, and media works together in in uh, within this organization. Vic itself is, uh, is is company. We deliberately created this as a company because we didn't want to to be uh, a trust, a foundation, or uh, an NGO, so that we can. Uh, we have to, you know, depend always on other, um, you know, funding sources. Rather, we decided that we would earn our own money, and then we we would uh, be very uh, enough independent to decide what we are really, you know, um, uh, want to do. So uh, our uh, mandate for 
uh, pointing to the arts to the society was very important. And then uh, it was quite easier for us because uh, it was we who were deciding how we were gonna um, take on them. Um, coming back to Greek again, it's operated uh, by different departments like photography archive is the one very first one, as I told you. There is a group of photographers um, who uh, takes care of the photography part. Uh, we also have a very rich research department. I'll talk about that later. Um, we have uh, 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 an audiovisual department uh, which takes uh, takes on documentaries and others. Um, we have a gallery. We have uh, one of the uh, finest private gallery in, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, which definitely plays very important role when we, you know, showcase our work. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, Reza. I'm wondering if you want to share your screen. Um, I'll, I'll, or I'll, at a later point. Uh, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do okay. just, uh, I'll right. just okay. finishing, just finishing yeah, the yeah. interaction. Yeah. So Sorry. this is how actually, you know, uh, we started and then, uh, you know, we um, um, shared um, um, our uh, resources. We uh, uh, tried to create, you know, um, core fighters and then, at some point, we uh, actually decided that, okay, now it's a, it's a time to create um, your own um, archive, which will tell the history of Bangladesh, which will take the, uh, which will represent Bangladesh. And, and of course, I mean, it, it started in, in the very beginning of uh, uh, 89, but then later on how we proceeded, I'll, I'm, I'm going to share you the screen so that it, uh, it helps me to, um, share uh, to explain a little bit. Okay, so uh, as I was telling that it's, it's definitely how uh, came came up as a uh, with a specific mandate. And then um, then we uh, while we were you know digging, uh, we had our uh, the pioneer photographer who was um, the first Bengali Muslim um, photographer, um, and and he was one, one of the sh earliest short story writer in Bangladesh, and uh, that's that backs to the twenties uh, from with with glass plate negatives. So that's where we you know uh, uh, we um, we can look back to the to the um, I mean to the area era, uh, so twenties, thirties, forties. Um, so some of the examples, Mr. Golam Kashem Daddy, who um, later on created um, uh, a camera club, who had, uh, who was one of the center point for our photographers at that time, um, and when the salon, you know, practice was it was important, and uh, and then at uh, the time when he was he he was practicing was mostly on twenties and thirties. And then later on, it's, it's, it's a, it, it was it's a big gap. There were um, during the Pakistan era, there were news photographers uh, who were working in the in the newspaper, a bit of salon, but not very much strong representation of Bangladeshi photography history. Um, and uh, it's mostly actually the Liberation War, which finally uh, I would say helped to you know um, to to unite uh, as a as a as a photographer of a country, um, so the liber during the liberation war, a lot of uh, international photographer came in, uh, but the 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 story from within actually were taken by the photographers, uh, the local photographers. There were news photographers like Rashid Talukdar who were documenting um, from '69 uh, or even earlier, and uh, there were other photographers, uh, not always uh, the uh, the photographer from uh, media, but also the amateur photographer who were documenting uh, the uh, the the war and uh, creating and writing the visual history of Bangladesh. So Rashid Talukdar was one of the veteran photographer who really documented quite extensively. So his work is with us. Um, it's more than 100,000 um, images, which uh, are still waiting to be, uh, you know, digitized. Uh, this is one of the photographer uh, from the 
um, uh, from northern side of Bangladesh, Muhammad Shafi. Uh, this is a very interesting image. Um, uh, these two women was actually smuggling grenade, uh, and it's, it's a fantastic uh, story uh, to tell. Uh, it's, it's beyond the war. It's beyond you know the other uh, agonies and atrocities, but it's also the participation of women um, in the war. And same as this, uh, Saida Khanum, our uh, the most senior, most uh, female photographer who just passed away um, um, some time back. So she was also documenting and 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 uh, documenting the liberation war. So it was atrocity. It was um, uh, the agony. And uh, Abdul Rai Hamid Raihan, who is from Kustia, uh, he was an amateur photographer, and he actually. Uh, was you know um, moving around the border side border area with his camera and then you know crossed the border and stayed there so it he was never appointed by someone but he was really you know telling this story which was very um uh, very local very earthy and very authentic um so while the professional photographers were documenting um uh, the uh, the stuff's happening uh also people like hamid raihan after Ahmed was also documenting uh, uh the war from from very close so this is uh, uh, in a way actually um, a collection which has become the largest collection of drake's archive and um, unfortunately this is the largest uh, archive of bangladeshi history uh, is supposed to be done by uh, uh, supposed to be done nationally, but uh, we 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 started quite early, and then this is one of the actually most important archive. Uh, if I uh, compare it in with other works, now um, after the liberation war, uh, the photography practice. If we look at the um, our pathfinders, um, there were many fine photographers who uh, were. Um, practicing as a salon photographers, a uh, little bit of storytelling in terms of in, in longer narratives, but mostly on salon. Um, Amanul Hawk was uh, one who was involved in producing uh, photographs for uh, a magazine called Bichinta. He was documenting, was very close to uh, Satyajit Ray, so documenting um, um, his work and family. Um, he was uh, cre he created a series, very popular series for the news magazine, uh, Bichitra, uh, which is which is called Amadesh, and which actually, if, if you look at this image, uh, women with uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, lilies, and that's that's a type kind uh, kind of visual images he was actually creating a beautiful of beautiful Bangladesh. Um, Bijan Shorkar was one who was actually one. Uh, uh, of the photographer who started experimenting. So he loved experimenting. So he had done interesting exper experimentation in, in dark room. Uh, but at the same time, who also had eye of on looking things from the other end. So um, uh, the, the, the time when they were practicing, uh, Noah Zesh Ahmed, uh, who was a botanist actually, but uh, taking photographs, uh, we we had again. Uh, sorry, this is a wrong um, credit. Is by Saida Khanum. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, the early photographer, uh, women photographer, uh, very surrealistic, very uh, different language. He she was using at that uh, the time when she was taking photograph. Uh, and uh, definitely uh, the. That salon period was over when um, there was a change in the language of photography. Uh, there were photographers who were telling the story in longer, uh, with longer you know, collection, longer uh, uh, photographs, uh, working long time. Um, the largest collection what we have in in Greek is by Shaidul Alam. So he started uh, mostly. Uh, documenting the military regime in in 80s uh, and his his work was uh, uh, was a, was, a, was a quite important documentation in in the in the second liberation of Bangladesh if I if I say um, uh, Shaidul worked also worked with uh, with 
issues those um, at, the, at the time when he used uh, worked on the issues was uh, was not quite um, common. Like um, uh, this is a photograph from uh, one of the project Positive Lives, uh, the HIV AIDS, the the very early days of HIV AIDS when it was a taboo to talk about um, HIV AIDS. So we had an exhibition on, on uh, um, called Positive Lives. Shaydul had work and, and we we displayed here in Bangladesh, even though people uh, put, didn't talk about it. So these are some of the issues which actually uh, created uh, in a way uh, um, uh, okay, an awareness. So people started talking about it. Um, it's again uh, a, a, the, an important issue. Again, another important issue on on the migrant labors. Uh, as you know, that the Bangladeshi migrants are uh, all over the world, and it's it's only uh, the money we look at, which uh, which is an important contribution to the country. But uh, very uh, few photographers have worked in depth on to look at the uh, lives and. Uh, an experience of uh, of, uh, of the migrant labors. So his this is um, a, a, a very important body uh, of uh, Shahidul's. Um, uh, um, from... Reza, you have about yes. two minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So um, uh, another important body which we have is uh, on on extrajudicial killing. This is called crossfire, um, and they they are. Uh, stories also uh, when we st uh, when we you know showcase the work the police came and they actually closed down the gallery uh, but we took them to to the high court and and actually we were uh, they were backed off and we finally um, um, showed the work in our gallery so so we take a lot of issues which actually um, not always the issues that are typically, you know, the photographers talk about or Bill's story. I'll just, I'll just like to finish uh, uh, the presentation with a very quick, uh, uh, you know, uh, some slides. Uh, an interesting project uh, called Morphosal Photography. Uh, so we actually linked young photographers from our school uh, to the rural visual journalists uh, and then started uh, documenting and collecting and researching on the photographer who usually we don't you know talk about from the small towns and and we surprisingly we we found that back in 1936 when Dhaka photographers were nowhere. Uh, the photo photographers were practicing in Kulna, they were uh, in other parts of the city. Along the border, there was strong practice uh, of photography. This is from Russia, um, from Jeshore, and uh, it was fantastic that we actually, you know, showcased the work to, the, to our festival. Uh, it was a very strong body of work. But what, last but not least, what I'd like to add that is um, th this uh, project actually gave us uh, a light uh, that the story of Bangladesh, what we see now is very, very incomplete. So we are continuing the research so that we, at some point we can um, uh, create an anthology of Bangladesh. Over to you. Thank you. Thank yep. you so much, uh, Reza. And, and thank you to, to all of our um, speakers. Um, I think with this, um, we, can, we can start the, the, I mean, this is such an exciting panel and I have so many questions. Um, and, and I invite our audiences to actually post uh, questions or comments, um, you know, using the, the Q&A feature. Um, and while they're doing this, I think maybe I'd, I'd like to start off, um, uh, you know, I mean, one of the things that's sort of evident in, in all of your presentations is sort of uh, public engagement, you know, the notion of collaboration or participation. I mean, it, it seems to be sort of inviting people, you know, into the archive or, or you know, sort of uh, taking the archive out in a sense seems to be sort of an important aspect of, of the work that all of you are doing. And, and this does sort of, of course, you know, it does disrupt a very sort of hegemonic idea of how we think about, you know, um, knowledge being produced, knowledge being disseminated, which, you know, especially when we think about it coming from an archive, it's usually like thought of as a one-way traffic, 
you know. Um, so I wanted to ask though, would you be able to share or recall any interesting encounters, interesting anecdotes or instances when say, through these public engagements, through sort of interventions of peoples, um, you know, how sort of maybe a particular, um, you know, a document or, or you know, how, how something changed about um, say a particular document or how, how it sort of added a very different kind of charge to the archive. Um, I in, sort of invite um, all of you to sort of share maybe something. Um, any of you, please. Well, not, not exactly to respond to this, but I, I, I'd like to um, add an interesting um, uh, scenario. Um, uh, the way we started actually was not only uh, collecting images, that was only merely, uh, you know, um, uh, a part of the initiative. It was important that, uh, you know, we uh, uh, create awareness on our photographers, train them, uh, equip them. Uh, copyright was nowhere in Bangladesh. I mean, uh, the publication, the newspaper were using materials just like, you know, it's, it's their, their, you know, own property. So if you look back uh, 20 years back, or 30 years back, the newspaper of Bangladesh, you won't find any name under the uh, photographer. Uh, if you go through and compare it now, uh, you'll, you'll find it's changing. You'll find the name of the photographer and uh, that's an important uh, contribution. I would say rather, uh, rather the archive, the school. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a learning through that actually the awareness among the photographer in the country scenario is uh, is actually you know um, uh, it's, it's, it's an important contribution uh, and apart from that it's also about um, uh, the photographer's own right uh, even even say just a few days back we saw uh, newspapers countrywide newspaper where stealing our photos without even creating, uh, uh, putting any, any credit because that was of prime ministers. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, and, 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 and people uh, started talking about it. So it's, it's important that uh, while we um, uh, collect and, you know, um, uh, create platform for the, for the photographer and create an archive. At the same time, it's also important that the photographers uh, are also get their right, get, they get paid and they get their recognition. So uh, this is an interesting um, uh, uh, changes, I would say, I have seen in the last 20 years. Uh, just one small example, the change in the putting credit in the newspaper. Mm, thank you, thank you for that, yeah. Divas, Sophia, would you? Sophia, you want to go first? You can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering, uh, Sneha, thinking back to the projects we've done, um, the two projects that I was uh, particularly involved with, um, which were the Dalit, Dalit uh, Quest for Dignity and the Feminist Memory Project, I think one of the realization uh, during that project has been, you know, like we um, we go in as archivists, you know, to collect, um, but uh, we we keep encountering how you know the different levels or types of documentation and archiving that happen in like many different scales, um, even prior to our arrival. Um, and I think uh, one of the sort of real uh, realization that happened, especially during the feminist memory project, was. How much of that archiving, um, personal archives or institutional archives, were being kept for reasons that we hadn't anticipated? For you know, for uh, for example, we may we go in uh, thinking about you know how to you know questions of representation, uh, which we have discussed here, um, or strategies of representation that you know that that an archive should be doing so forth. Uh, but we realized how much of actually the, the people's everyday kind of engagement with the archive and archiving had to do with um, actually um, not so much with uh, how photos, for instance, represent, um, but how photos, photos become sort of an index, um, index of um, sort of being present, you know. Um, and I think uh, that, I think that really has informed the way that uh, we've started thinking about uh, what the archive does. And I think in our own language also, we've veered away slightly from uh, representation to um, other ways of sort of signifying and um, uh, giving form to the archive. 
Um, I can pull uh, examples of this perhaps, but uh, I don't want to take more time. Thanks, um, Sophia. Um, I think I'm thinking of oral histories that maybe like were a turning point. And I think, um, I mean, almost every single oral history has been like, has, you know, touched me in some way. But I think um, when we've done collaborations, that has been extremely just formative in terms of thinking of the way we saw one event. So collaborations with the 1947 archive or with the partition uh, museum, um, just um, or going to Bangladesh and conducting the oral history interviews there. I think just having um, hearing an account of the same thing um, has just you know been extremely powerful and just um, ma made me rethink a lot of things and very transformative in how we were working and thinking about our work. Thank you, thank you. I want to um, circle back to something that Divas mentioned about the, the photograph uh, um, and, and, and how sort of uh, one may want to think about it, not just you know in, on, on representational terms, but, but the photograph is standing for something else. And you know, because one of the things that is striking about um, you know, the three sort of um, projects and archives where, where you all are working is the, the, the place of the photograph. And you know, um, it does seem to sort of hold central place um, to a large extent in all of your work. And and so um, and and one of the things that is striking today when we're looking at sort of uh, the cropping up of new archives in various parts of the region today, many of these are also photo archives. You know, many of these actually sort of uh, predominantly, at least the core of their collections, do seem to be photo archives. So I mean, I just wanted to get your um, sense also. I mean, what in in your opinion, what is it that a photograph is is able to do in a sense, uh, in a way that other perhaps other documents are are not able to do, or or uh, just just getting sort of your thoughts on the photograph as a document. Um, I mean, yeah, uh, any of you, please. Um, should I begin? So oh. I'm thinking about. Um, F. E. Chaudhry's archive that he's uh, that we have at CAP, and um, he has documented um, uh, a lot of the refugee journeys. Um, so the trains, and then also post partition, the setting up of refugee camps. And I, ge I guess one of the things is well, it's a huge archive and very um, telling, informative photographs, but also the fact that the photographer is there, the photographer is is present is part um, of the situation and then thinking about how this photographer is viewing, is framing, um, how he's participating or not participating. Um, so I think, and then and then his history um, as, as part of that entire process, uh, I think that's a big part of it. Um, and I think what's very interesting with Drake, it seems as though they, it, the categorization is so much by photographers, um, which is very, very interesting because we have a few, but Drake, the Drake Library seems to have um, a very expansive categorization of photographers. Uh, just to add to that, uh, it's, of course, it's important to uh, uh, photography um, uh, as, as a, as a as a content of archive, uh, but also, I mean, uh, oral history is also similarly important. Uh, we uh, recently, we also thought about uh, archiving uh, multimedia stories done by the contemporary uh, visual um, uh, producers. So we have countrywide, we have uh, visual journalists. We call them, uh, we have a network actually, it's called uh, Rural Visual Journalist Network. And they produce local stories using uh, very minimalistic um, uh, equipment like uh, iPod touch or, or, or mobile phone. And then they edit there, they make a script and they create the story and then they send it to us. We have a platform called breaknews.com which actually hosts them. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's an archive of multimedia story, more than thousand stories. 
these are the story which are coming from the very you know remote places from the very rude very uh, local the story which usually don't get to hear so the uh, the new media is also coming up uh, in our you know archiving um, uh, collection can i answer <laughs> Please. I think uh, my sense, um, Sneha, I think there are a bunch of things that uh, are playing, playing out in terms of why the new sort of crops of archives tend to focus on photographs. One, I think, um, uh, one of the most important ones, perhaps, has to do with how ph photography has become, in a way, the, the primary sort of mode of documentation, of, you know, just popularly available. Um, you know, the sort of like the new technologies um, that have given these affordances that, and you see this every way, you know, I think the, the main way that people record today is through photographs. So I think in the last 20 years, there has been a kind of an attention on photography that has to do, I think, beyond sort of the specific archival um, uh, initiatives that have emerged, but rather to do with the sort of the media culture in which uh, these archives are emerging. Uh, that number one. Um, and I think, uh, secondly, also, um, when you think about photographs, it's actually one of the oldest um, formats that have been around that haven't actually uh, gained or garnered enough archival attention. And I think it wasn't until like the 1980s when archivists seriously began to think about uh, what it means to, you know, how to go about um, um, actually archiving and, and cataloging and creating sort of guidelines for preserving photographs. So it's, uh, it's started very late, even though photography is something that as a sort of a format that has been around as long, in fact, as far back as uh, the first um, National Archives started in the 1820s, 30s. Uh, so in fact, the journey of uh, the, the sort of the history of technology and the history of archives are kind of very closely tied. Uh, but it has constantly kind of slipped away. So I think it's also because of that, um, uh, when sort of the, the possibility of expanding um, formats for the archive started happening in the 70s and 80s, uh, photographs obviously had to be the prime one that had to gain attention. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are other reasons too that we can sort of sit and think about it more. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for that. There are lots and lots of questions in the in the oh, Q and So I'm I'm actually going to um, read out a couple of them, and then I think you know maybe um, whoever feels like you know sort of taking up some of these questions. Um, is there any while we're documenting history? How is Asia in terms of new media archives? Is there any archive focusing on new on new media arts or well, I mean, or perhaps in, in this context, I mean, you know, how is the question of new media tackled by say any of the archives that, that you're working with? Um, I think they were spoke already to, to the question of digital media to, to some extent. Um, but if, if anybody would like to take this on, um, new media archives. So what formats would that be with video or? Any, any of these, I suppose, yeah, video, digital, sort of. I, mean. well, I can just add for the, to, to you know, um, clear, clarify the reason why we actually stepped in, in, in the video format. Yeah. It's, it's actually not the format which we picked. It is, it's the storytelling. That's what we uh, thought that we are strong uh, or our photographers are stronger. Uh, and these are the people who, uh, could document quite well with uh, the moving image. So that's how actually we stepped in. It's not because we were using new media or audiovisual material, it's other way, it's rather, you know, uh, for the uh, for sharing their stories with with the medium. Uh, just, it, is, uh, it, is, it is not the clarify. format that, it is not the exactly. format that determined in a sense, yeah. Exactly, sure. right. Sure. Absolutely. Um, there, there is a, a, a question here, um, which I think can be sort of interesting. Uh, it, it says, uh, with uh, digitization um, occupying a key part of the changing landscape of the archive. Um, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me come back to that. There's, there's a question before that I wanted to read. Do the organizations that you all work with have advocacy 
components that work with or push government authorities in terms of either school education, from curriculum to textbook publications, using your photography and your oral history archives, or have there been similar initiatives that you've undertaken? I understand that working with government offices in terms of addressing historical narratives is difficult, uh, but if you have engaged in this, what sort of tactics or perhaps subversive measures have you have you used? And I think, um, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think all of you did touch upon this, this, you know, sort of what are the, you know, levels of negotiation with the state that one, you know, I mean, in a, in to some extent, you know, the reason why citizens archives crop up is because either because of, you know, either the failure of the state to sort of document all of these things as state apathy, or perhaps even very partisan narratives of the state, you know, which which then leave out a whole lot. But in terms of your experience, what is your experience been sort of engaging and I think Sophia maybe we can start off with you because you did sort of elaborate on how a citizen's archive deals with a national museum uh, and and perhaps even becomes part of it if I if I understand correctly uh, maybe we could start off with you um so well specifically to schools as well um and again um as a non-profit um the, the funding comes in for certain things and everyone has to survive. So um, we, we've had a program called the School Outreach Tours, um, which goes in and out of session. And what that, uh, what that entailed was that it took um, a, a number of educationalists came on board and worked with the design team, the archivist, your history project to create um, a curriculum that was more inclusive um, that didn't completely gloss over certain important parts of the history that focused on marginalized communities that focused on the roles of, of women in the country and in particular movements. Um, so, and this took the form of a written educational curriculum, but then also um, it, uh, you know, and uh, we have a, a great video department most of the time. And so animated films were, created based on some of the oral histories and um, and it was uh, it was sort of a very holistic sort of a curriculum that was then taken to schools but then also um, it, it's still on YouTube actually and I think everyone can uh, uh, everyone has access to our links I think but it is on the Citizens Archive YouTube so you can get a sense of how um, the history of the nation is being taught outside of the museum context um, and um, it's and you know in some ways again you have to have YouTube access to the internet to access it but what was really amazing was then when we actually got to go to these government schools um, and some private schools as well and um, and actually uh, teach this curriculum the teachers were really amazing um, that is I guess outside of the museum um, I, I'm I don't remember the question I can stop now also we can we can come back uh, um, to you and I, I don't think it was I, I think it was very much sort of well, I can add to that uh, the, to, the, to the scenario in Dhaka I mean actually we didn't have to do anything if government could take it over I mean that's why well uh, uh, you know um, we have to do what we're doing um, uh, looking if you look at the art scenario in Bangladesh the largest uh, Biennale the um, the art Biennale which is the national art Biennale in international one, this is it's a it's, it's a very it's the oldest one I believe in in Saudi uh, in Asia is that's the very first uh, Biennale. Uh, until couple of uh, last Biennale, they didn't have any category like photography, and we had to scream, we had to you know lobby, we had to you know uh, speak and be use bitter words, and uh, and now it's there. Uh, if you look at the national um, um, uh, art school, the faculty. It doesn't have a department uh, like photography, and uh, finally we had to create our own school. And then, which is which is very interesting, is that actually uh, our photography um, uh, department is affiliated under Dhaka University now, not under the fa uh, Faculty of Fine Arts. It's under the Social Science, and now it's a full fledged um, uh, graduation. So it's an interesting, you know, um, um, push, uh, you scream, you, you know, make a uh, push and you uh, make some quarrel. If it doesn't work, do it by yourself. So that's what we did. And now it's, it's at some point, it 
it it's coming up as a collaboration uh it's still a long way to go but uh, it's a it's, I, I i would say it's it's a sweet story thanks for thanks for that uh, reza uh, there was anything to, to add yeah i mean um, nepal picture library itself doesn't have um, um advocacy sort of orientation uh, but you know having said that you know the way we work we do have we do have a very extensive and broad strong sort of collaborative networks and we mobilize our networks for a lot of the research we do the exhibitions um, um, and so the, in, the, in terms of lobbying the state or sort of the curricular developments that was suggested in the question, um, I mean, Charity is here, who's sort of been, has collaborated with us in developing curricular um, programs, taking um, material to classrooms, so forth. Um, and also, you know, uh, apart from the curricular and educational sort of uh, outreach programs that uh, are always adjacent to the, uh, the archival projects we do, uh, I've also noticed how, you know, like in a small country like Nepal, um, actually the state is not very far away from, from us, you know, actually in terms of the personnel, uh, there are a lot of overlaps that happens. And uh, especially in the feminist memory project, for example, you know, a lot of the drives we were doing, people we were actually sort of seeking help from uh, were themselves involved in uh, certain types of lobbying um, with the state. For example, one that had come up was the creation of uh, a women's museum, uh, which uh, our project kind of became a, in a way attached to those kind of lobbies as well. I mean, nothing came out of it. Maybe it's still going on, but you know, like um, the inter because of the overlap of personnel's um, relations, that sort of the networks in which we operate, um, they're not, the state isn't very sort of as much as we like to pretend. Um, there's a lot of overlap that happens. Yeah, it isn't necessarily uh, so so far away and, and, and yeah. such a sort of a top down perhaps structure as you sort of imagine. Um, there's a there's a question here, uh, a comment and a question. Thank you all for the wonderful insights into archiving as a discipline and its significance. My question would be: What are some strategies that small self-funded collectives can can employ? to make the process of archiving more sustainable. Any advice for from, from this? And I can, I can share my, our experience. I mean, um, the way we um, <clears throat> work is, is, is a, it's a photo bank. I mean, I would rather say. So it's, a, it's an archive which works as a photo bank. That means the photographer, uh, they um, keep it in the bank. And when someone uses, the, uses it, they pay for it. And by doing that, actually, the archive sustains and also the photographer sustain. Uh, the phenomenon, the uh, practice, earlier practice of any photograph belongs to any, uh, you know anyone. So that actually you know uh, is is changing. So one important um, um, area actually is you have to be sustainable. Otherwise, you can't. Uh, and, and and archiving is 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 expensive. It's, it's every minute. You know, it, it's money. So to do that, you have to create a way so that you can um, uh, you can channel some sources, some income, and then you can do what what you really wanted to do. So this one design, what we practice is actually um, uh, uh, catering the photographer's uh, content to local and international uh, platform or international you know uh, market is one how we actually you know do it. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa. Actually, connected to this, maybe, I'm, I'm actually going to rope in another question over here because as a way of sort of also dealing with this question of, of you know, the, the amount of resources it takes to sort of, you know, manage and sustain an, an archive. And um, there is a, a question here from uh, Nilton Clark, who, who says, many thanks for your presentations. With digitization occupying a key part of the changing um, landscape of, of uh, the archive, the question is about the maintenance and safekeeping of the analog and hard copy realm. Does the um, uh, latter assume an increasingly low priority, the, the hard, the ana I suppose the analog or the hard copy, uh, uh, does it assume an increasingly lower priority given that it is now only one side of the coin, so to speak, what about practical demands like space and storage requirements, adequacy of conditions, funding, 
and resources for hard copy materials in your respective locales. So I suppose it's, it's also a question of our, our, you know, our digital archives, because they may seem like, you know, you need lesser space because they seem like they're cost effective or comparatively sort of also cost effective, et cetera, et cetera. Does it seem like, I mean, what, what happens to the physical material? Um, would, would any of you like to take this up? Um, in our case, we actually do it parallelly. I mean, until and unless we are done with digitization, uh, we, we can't move our extension. Uh, but of course, I mean, uh, we have a professional archiving system. So when I say pro professional, it's, it's not uh, the 100% uh, requirement uh, that we can actually uh, provide. But of course, we control the temperature, we control the air, and we have a specific place and the system of handling is is uh is something that we uh um we, at, at the moment we are happy of course there are a lot of uh thing to do but as i mentioned a few minutes back is it it is expensive it is expensive every minute you spend to look after your archive actually eating up uh a lot of uh you know um uh, a lot of your resources now uh, until and unless you're prepared for that uh or a design you create a design is is difficult to sustain. So um, so we have um, tested a lot over the years, and at some point we try um, we 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 created a design which uh, still we are you know uh, we're in the market. So I I I hope that um, uh, that should work. But I should warn that um, you have to have a really you know a lot of resources. If you really want to um, take care of your physical archive, the digital part is quite easier. Once it is done and it's all you know uh, taken care of, metadata, then it's the space uh, what you actually um, and some a little bit of management. But physical one takes much more than that. Mm -hmm. Devas, would you like to come in? No, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, the sustainable way to go is digital you know i mean we don't have the capacity and the means and the resources to um, hold uh, physical photographs um, that i mean going digital is dramatically cheaper um, obviously um, i don't know what the was that the question about? yeah well, i mean and there were there were two questions and this was one but i think the other was also about uh, what are some strategies for sort of self funded uh, sort of initiatives to sustain yeah. themselves so yeah, yeah. So, I mean, for us, uh, what we've been doing is the, the maintaining part, you know, because we are ma mainly digital, I think the costs are way cheaper. I think what we have to deal with is certain sort of entropies of the digital medium. And uh, I think that, you know, what I tried to lay out earlier about how the uh, archiving the digital medium functions, I think those, I don't think we have necessarily thought about it or necessarily grappled what entails, uh, what it entails. Um, so I guess that the concerns are more, um, um, of that nature, uh, but how we've been sort of uh, staying afloat uh, so far is because the interest is in creating archives, we, we design uh, projects that help us sort of build archives um, and, uh, and so the funding comes for the projects, but you know, we use, uh, we use that time and the uh, resources and the money uh, to essentially build our uh, digital collections. Um, and I've, uh, I think with Sneha and Samir, I've, I've spoken uh, before as well about how like, um, I think archives working in the art space, uh, tapping into sort of the infrastructures of, the, of uh, art, uh, that has really helped us as well in, in terms of uh, sustaining and you know, continuing our work. And I think, so essentially, I think one has to be clever about um, you know, how we sort of um, tap into available resources. Um, uh, you know, we've, we've tried all kinds of tacks uh, to basically enable ourselves to continue doing digital archiving work. Yeah, yeah. Sophia, would you like to come in? Yes, sure. So similar to the bus, um, we do not have the capacity to house. Um, we have for very few people, but the type of environmental temperature requirements required to um, handle photographs and objects is just something we do not have. In fact, even the digital part of it, the oral histories, the photographs, the digitization, even that is so expensive. And, um, and, and grants come and go. And often grants um, depend on meeting certain objectives. 
so you it, it is sometimes tough when when you have a project that doesn't meet those objectives um to to sustain a project or to there's so many sort of shelf projects that you have and you know whenever a grant arises that fits that sort of bid you try and use it to to build the archive based on that project but very often there's not a project that's interested um in that kind of an archive so you know we wait and um and uh, some people are generous and some and um in in our particular archive i guess the founding members also sort of spearheaded a lot of projects of their own so it was lucky like that but sustainability is a huge issue um the other thing is um in terms of uh, but definitely digital is is cheaper but it's still very very expensive because equipment is expensive backups are expensive the kinds of scanners and everything you need all these things are very very expensive and then also uh, so what we do is uh, uh, we don't uh, we either bring the stuff scan photograph it take it back or we go to a site and do it there at libraries or certain people's collections uh, but even that i mean you you have to be like you need um, some things are so um, initially i guess there's uh, we used simpler things and now we have like this like fancy thing that scans from the top i don't even know what it's called but we did for those who are starting out we did start with just like one camera, some things on phone cameras. Um, and in terms of um, sustaining a smaller um, archive, um, there are a lot of resources online. So for instance, the 1947 uh, archive project has this citizen historian program, and that is sort of one way in which you yourself can learn how to take an oral history of someone. We created um, this uh, set once of interviewing your own grandparents. Um, there's many archives that have this. Uh, Ishita Shah from Curating from Culture, she has so many incredible resources. Um, and, and one thing I've realized is even though uh, way, way back in the beginning, some of the oral historians in the team were um, trained by the British Library and they have gone on different trainings here and there. But then what happens is that you come back home and you realize that your conditions or your goals or the kind of archive and space that you want to create or just the nature of your work, the nature of the city or the space that you're in. I mean, you really have to localize all these methods to, to suit it, right? Our, our methods are not going to be the same as anywhere else um, because getting around this city or another city in Pakistan is very different. Um, so I, I think what we what we realized is uh, we need to study everything and there's so many resources out there, uh, big models, small models, uh, very avant-garde mo models also which you can keep looking at to question you know what you're doing but if, if eventually what what i think uh, is best is if you sort of look at your conditions and you localize the process to meet uh, your your group's needs and the needs of the archive uh, that needs to be um, collected mm -hmm. you should uh, i just wanted can i add something Sneha? Please. Yeah, I think it's also good to remember that the, that the digital medium is actually very tolerant of, um, you know, the kind of images that circulate in the digital um, uh, platform. And, you know, Hito Style has this article called In Defense of Bad Images poor or image. Poor Images. Yeah. And I think that's, that's useful, you know, to take as an inspiration that actually that, you know, we are very tolerant. We're very used to a very low quality, low resolution images as well. Um, and so, which is in effect for archival project, uh, it means that you do not actually, you know, we use, yeah, I mean, as Sophia was pointing out, I think the equipments, the cost for even for digital ar archiving is quite expensive, but you can also go quite um, low key, you know, uh, you can, you can start with um, in pretty, with pretty basic um, available um, um, uh, equipments, I think, um, the internet itself, um, because it's a, I guess it's a benefit that the internet itself is based on an archival and database model. So much of our life actually, you know, because it happens on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they're all actually based on this database archival structure. You know, they support sort of archive building projects in ways that uh, weren't available even 15 years ago. So I think, you know, those are, I mean, I think those are initiatives that should happen, you know, as I think it brings certain recognitions um, empowerments that can be achieved through those means as well. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm aware of time, but I also know that there are so many questions um, that, that are there. But I'm, I'm you know, given sort of uh, time, I, I suppose what we can do is we can send sort of um, the, the contact of, you know, sort of the people and sort of the questions as well to the speakers and, and maybe you can respond to them sort of over email or something like that. But we won't be able to take any more questions uh, today. Um, so I'm, I'm very sorry about that. But I, I thank you all. I, I thank our speakers. Um, this has been such a sort of a fantastic and, and thought-provoking thought discussion. I feel like we barely touched upon um, you know, sort of many, many of the ideas that, that, that have come through in, in all of your presentations. Um, and, and I want to thank our, our audiences as well for staying with us. Uh, before we end, I would like to share that we have one more iteration of the Interarchives Conversations as part of the Mobile Library Nepal, which will be held early next year. So do stay tuned for that. Um, I also want to thank the AA and Mobile Library team for their support, Susanna, Sharare, Rebecca, and really a huge thanks to Samira, who you know was responsible for putting this program together. Um, and, and thank you all for, for attending. Um, take care. Have a good evening. Thank you, Sneha. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Sneha. Thank you.